Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Higher Ground, uh, brought to you by Razzle. I am your host, Farah Tariq. Today, we're speaking with Dana Cisneros, who is the founder of the Cannabis Corporate Law Firm. And we're going to talk about some of her work with Normal and with our local uh, governments here in Southern California. But first, we have a word from our sponsor. Apricot Analytics is a full-service product quality lab for cannabis testing and CBD and hemp testing. They have over a decade of analytical lab experience and have been working with cannabis products since 2005. Apricot Analytics understands the needs of cannabis and hemp producers because they were producers themselves. They know the challenges, the frustrations, and the dreams of cultivators and manufacturers. They get it because they've been there, and they're here to help. Apricot Analytics tests your products for the good stuff, like THC uh, and CBD concentrations, and helps you identify any of the bad stuff, like pesticides, mold, bacteria, and heavy metals. For more information, go to apricotanalytics.com, or to learn more about their current investment opportunity, go to the Razzle Investment Marketplace at razzle.com. Hi, and welcome back. Thanks for joining us today on The Higher Ground. We are here with Dana Cisneros. Hi, Dana. How are you? Hi, how are you? Doing well. Um, so good to see you. Uh, I know in these times it's a little bit different. Now we're seeing each other digitally. I miss seeing your face in person. <laughs> but I know we're keeping busy. And uh, you've been doing some work with Normal here in Orange County. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so I was just elected as the co-chair of the Orange County Normal's um, uh, local licensing task force, which is pushing local legalization throughout Orange County. Um, we are getting ready to launch a new campaign um, that'll be um, focused on Orange County, but anyone is, of course, welcome to reach out to us. Um, we're gonna be highlighting the faces of cannabis um, and the people who are really behind the companies um, that make our industry so great, um, showing um, the folks that are outside our industry and especially local electeds and local officials, city staff, um, how, important it is to acknowledge that these are real people, real business people with families um, that support the community, that take active roles in their communities, um, that, you know, especially with cultivators that love love the plant, love the earth. Uh, these are socially responsible individuals. Um, so it's no longer a thing where if someone uses cannabis that they should be looked at um, in a bad light, but instead, we'll really use this um, opportunity to highlight all of the good that our industry has to offer. That's great. That's something I'm really passionate about and feel my responsibility to help break the stigma as a professional in the cannabis industry um, and a personal consumer. So I'm really excited to see that coming out of normal. Um, I know they're a really great educational resource and uh, doing a lot of work with local governments. You know, in California, things, it, you know, it's been legal here for cannabis, it's been legal here for a while, but there's still kind of local level efforts that are going on, right? Yeah, so one of the, the greatest challenges that came with legalization in 2018 was that Prop 64 left the decision to legalize or not largely with the cities. So it comes down in terms of commercial activity. Of course, we saw um, you know a lot of uh, criminal laws getting rolled back. But from a commercial aspect, um, a lot of the regulations come down to what the city, uh, how the city chooses to deal with commercial cannabis activities within their borders. There's also supposed to be an incentive uh, in Prop 64, which requires cities to legalize at least retail and commercial cannabis cultivation in order to be eligible to receive funds from the state for further enforcement. Um, most cities, by and large, in Orange County have not taken that step yet, even though Orange County did vote in favor of Prop 64 in 2016. So, um, you know, still today, um, you know, almost three years later, here we are, and, and we have only the shops that are located in Santa Ana that are that are licensed and legal um, on a retail level. We do have a number of cities coming up. Um, we have Anaheim that's coming, um, although they're going to put it on a ballot. Uh, the voters will need to first approve a tax measure before the ordinance will take effect. However, we are looking for some assistance um, for local efforts in Anaheim um, to encourage the city council to vote in favor of legalization. Their next meeting is on June 9th. And then um, the city of Fullerton is also making its way through the process as well. And we expect to see a good number of um, uh, retail opportunities come out of each city. Anaheim set their number at uh, 20 for the time being. Um, Fullerton, I'm not sure what they're going to do. Um, I recommended 10 to 1 per 10 to 15,000, which is 
is very reasonable um, in the grand scheme of things, and cities can kind of wrap their heads around that. At least there's some rational basis connected to why they're they're issuing the number of licenses or making the number of licenses available that they can. Um, a lot of it comes down to local zoning um, and, and properties that are located within those zones in order for operators to be able to um, engage in commercial activities legally. Um, one of the reasons why I decided to partner up with Normal is that I was getting a lot of comments um, from folks in the industry about trying to help craft ordinances on a local level uh, that would benefit their property or benefit just a pocket of properties. Um, and as much as, you know, I of course want to help my clients and advance their interests, legalization belongs to everybody. And so I wanted to work with a nonprofit organization so that it continues to belong to everyone, so that the efforts belong to everyone. So often we see operators come in and all these people participate in the process for five licenses and it's all the same folks every time. Um, and unfortunately, some of those larger businesses are no longer doing that well. So this is a really important step for, for local governments, especially given revenue reductions um, throughout the COVID pandemic. Um, so we're going to try to seize on that opportunity, um, highlight the good in our industry, and try to push, push the ball forward. Yeah, I love that. There's definitely a lot of voices and different stakeholders in the industry, some of whom have more money or a better position sometimes to get their version of uh, ordinance put in place. And really, you know, we're seeing how much this plant affects people in so many different ways, use them, uses it in so many different ways. And, you know, I, I love that, that you want it to belong to, to everybody because it does. There's, you know, we're all going to be interacting with this plant in different ways. And if we kind of allow just a few, a handful of people who just want to be license holders and maybe don't have the greater interest um, at heart, it's a little bit harder to, to think of everybody at once um, when it's just through that lens. Yeah, and we just saw a, a tremendous move take place last week um, in unincorporated Riverside County where the Board of Supervisors just took the caps off of everything. So now it's just a straight conditional use development agreement process. Um, I, it's not like any other business. This is cannabis. Everything there is going to be more difficult um, for our operators than, than normal, but um, at least there's not this really onerous RFP process that people, I, you know, granted, this is my bread and butter. People always hire me to write their license applications, but it shouldn't be that folks that are third generation, you know, cultivators that have been living on the land their whole life, has, they have to gather the money up to come and hire an attorney just to figure out how to even say, hey, I'd like to participate in the legal system. So Riverside County, um, you know, took an enormous step in the right direction, in my opinion, and, and, and took all the caps off. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll see a lot more retail open um, in the next you know, two years. It does take a good amount of time to get these businesses up and running before they Yeah, open. what does that mean exactly about the caps being removed? I'm not familiar. Um, oh. does that work to allow more people, I guess, to access the industry? So, yeah, so when I mentioned before, when I said, you know, Anaheim is authorizing 20, uh, Fullerton, I'm not sure, but there was, I made the recommendation of 10 to 15,000, one per 10 to 15,000 residents. Um, cities typically um, will put a cap on the number of licenses, uh, especially for retail, that they'll authorize within their borders. They're, they're very concerned about over-concentration of cannabis um, businesses in, in any one particular area, which, you know, is interesting because I don't think anybody ever cared before how many liquor stores there were. Um, and it's also the inevitable result of some cities in the county completely outlawing dispensaries, right? We see this in Orange County that they're all concentrated on one street in Santa Ana. <laughs> Right. So trying to avoid that, but they've also created it. And that's zoning, right? Those are all very specific industrial zones. Um, there's sensitive uses that we have to contend with as well. So um, cities can set different parameters. Um, so they have to be a certain number of feet from a par uh, from schools, from uh, K through 12, uh, from daycare facilities, parks. Some some cities throw in churches. Um, some cities throw in open space. The way they they classify park is, is different. So each city is different and, and that's okay. They need to look at what goes on within their own city. That was sort of the point. I don't think the point was ever though to eliminate access other than in one concentrated area in one city in an entire county of 3.2 million people. Um, that was not the point. 
And so, but unfortunately, Santa Ana is the only city that's come along thus far. And, and I thought last year, um, when, when everyone in all the cities and counties realized that uh, any delivery service can deliver with, into any city in California, I thought that would, that would encourage other cities to open up um, because that's just money on the table. Why would they not regulate that activity? Not to mention they can keep it safer by knowing what people are doing. They know which cars are on the road. They know the VINs and the license plate numbers that they can hand to the police department. And if they're not on that short list and they know you're delivering illegally, like those kind of things um, are, are not possible if you don't have a regulated system in place. Um, so we're trying to be a resource, not just for the cannabis community, but for the cities as well so that um, they have a place to go um, that's not wholly self-interested. Our only interest is uh, making this the best you know, possible you know, legalization environment as we can that's safe um, and that's frankly competitive. Right now it's, it's difficult um, when there's only 20 businesses in the entire county. That's, that's a, it's not that much competition. Um, so we are, um, we're cognizant of that. I know um, we, we're just, we're working on putting together our committee. So if, if any operators or other folks are, are, are interested in helping our, our task force out, reach out. Founded by former NFL All-Pro Kyle Turley, NeuroXPF is a sports supplement company specializing in the medicinal benefits of cannabinoids. NeuroXPF makes and sells a full line of high quality certified organic hemp derived CBD products. All NeuroXPF products are THC free. They use a special CO2 extracting process to isolate the CBD, working hard to preserve the terpenes uh, in order to modulate the effects of their hemp derived CBD. This adds that little extra punch to NeuroXPF products so they taste better and provide some beneficial qualities. To learn more about and purchase the NeuroXPF's products, please visit their website at neuroxpf.com. For more information about their current investment opportunity, please visit the Razzle Investment Marketplace at razzle.com. That's exciting that you've been appointed to that task force. Um, what do you think that's going to look like in the coming months and years, maybe? So like I said, we ha we're working on a campaign. Um, we're currently putting together um, a more formalized deck. Um, so we are approaching this professionally, and I think that's going to matter to cities. They're going to see, um, you know, more professionalism come out of Come out of our industry. It's important though that they understand who the OGs are and, and, and how we got here. Um, you know, it's also important that they create equitable opportunities uh, for people that have been disproportionately impacted by the failed war on drugs. It's, it's important that we take a look at that because it's, it's not appropriate that people are making millions and tens of millions of dollars off of the same activities that there are still people literally sitting in jail today for having done the same exact thing. And so there needs to be some recognition of that fact. Um, one of the groups that we're gonna be highlighting is Migraine Network. They are the first shared use facility in Santa Ana. Um, I, I believe in Orange County as well. They're a manufacturing company. And so the shared use licenses allow sort of one larger operator to come in, occupy the space, and then other small operators um, that, that engage in infusions um, or packaging and labeling can come in and rent out the space for a set time period. Um, so it really reduces the barrier to entry. The amount of capital required is significantly lower. Um, I just talked to one of the owners of Migraine Network like two weeks ago and he let me know that 18 companies have already signed up with them um, to take advantage of this. And they help with licensing and, and distribution and everything. So um, I, I would love to see Orange County you know, be small business friendly, um, not just a place where, you know, we see large operators, but be small business friendly as well. We saw, we, we miss a lot of the edible brands. They went away um, with the legacy market. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing more opportunities created for the people that really paved the way for legalization. Yeah, I think this barrier to entry issue is a big one um, across the country, especially, you know, it's interesting because California has been seen from the East Coast perspective, they see California and Colorado as states that have a relatively low area barrier to entry compared to some of these newer states that have gone online that literally have like 10 operators and they're all, you know, larger operators. Um, but I think the money issue in being able to get a license and operate and hold a space uh, really prevents a lot of people, a lot of the social justice component and the equity programs. Um, it really plays into that. So I love to hear that work you're doing. How can people find out more about that? I'm sure there's a lot of people who are trying to start up businesses or smaller operators who would love that support. 
um, or to find out about where there are states and programs going on that might be easier to get spaces. I mean, yeah, that company I just mentioned is Migraine Network. Um, I, I didn't know it at the time. They had an open house in Santa Ana, and I try to make it a point to support any business in Orange, any cannabis business in Orange County. So not knowing anybody and not knowing, <laughs> not knowing who, who were the owners, I, I went. I, I actually even put it in a newsletter. I blasted about 12 15 people I know ended up going. Um, and then um, one of the owners was giving tours and the gal who was serving drinks kept saying, oh, you'll meet Ken in a little bit. You'll meet Ken in a little bit. And then comes Ken and it's Kenny Wang, who was my friend from college and law school. We went to both together. Um, so it was such a, it was, and I haven't seen him since law school. So it was exciting to see him in the same, you know, same, same space as me um, and doing really good work. Um, so that's my green network. So if there are smaller operators in the manufacturing side that, that want, uh, that need space and kind of got left out of legalization, they have that opportunity um, for, I, I think, I think they say it's like around $50,000 um, for the startup costs, which is nothing compared to the five to X million um, that, you, um, you know, most operators need to, to get their doors open. Yeah, absolutely. Giving access to those people is, uh, mm -hmm. is a great mission. And I love that um, all this work that Normal is doing, helping cities for format them properly, format their programs properly, and helping more companies uh, thrive, you know, especially local California-based uh, companies for our local market here. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different groups, you know, the, the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, um, and, and a couple other groups that are, are making efforts um, within different jurisdictions. And, you know, Candace, who's the executive director of, <clears throat> excuse me, OC Normal, and I were talking one night, and it's like, we all want the same thing. We're all pushing for the same thing. Um, it's, it's hard to get everybody's interests sort of aligned. And so that's, that's going to be um, a big uh, component of what we're doing is, is trying to reach out to the other groups that are working in Orange County um, so that we present not only a united front, but that we're not working against each other um, and that we're all kind of um, strategically working together and playing to our, our strengths. And there's certainly a demand for that kind of assistance and expertise, right? These cities, I think, want to do it properly. And most of our city officials don't have any experience with cannabis until the last few years during legalization. So it's a lot of new information for them. Many of them are not consumers themselves. They don't know what it's like from that perspective. And they want to do right by both the business owners and their residents, right? So that can be a challenge. Um, so I'm really glad that there's organizations that understand that this needs to be uh, this needs to be done and they need some assistance. Yeah, they, they um, you know, uh, one we see all the time in Southern California is HDL. Um, and HDL has been a municipal consultant, be was a municipal consulting firm before cannabis. And they largely advise on tax issues um, and safety and, and law enforcement issues. Um, so they're working with Fullerton. Um, and they, they have a pretty um, basic package that they present. Um, which I think is fair, although a lot of cities have been sued um, that have engaged in, in those processes because in any merit-based process, somebody has to evaluate who gets more points for A or B, um, you know, in, in community benefits, neighborhood compatibility, security, safety, overall business plans, experience of operators, you know, pro formas and ability to capitalize themselves appropriately to open their doors. Um, so there's these different components that we see like time and time again from HDL um, and, and the cities tend to feel fairly comfortable with, with those components. Um, you know, it's kind of when they start meddling too much is when they might get themselves in trouble. Um, you know, right now we're defending uh, one of our clients licenses in a litigation in San Bernardino, although fingers crossed that should be resolved in the next two months um, with more licenses being issued. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, do you want to talk a little bit about um, kind of the other work that you do at your law firm? And it's clear that this has fed into your interest in getting involved on the city side and on the, um, you know, working with a nonprofit like Normal, uh, but certainly your experience and exposure to the industry. You see a lot of different um, operators struggling with, with these issues. Yeah, so we represent um, all different types of cannabis businesses, although we don't actually currently have a testing 
lab client. But beyond that, um, we represent everybody in the supply chain. We have retail clients as well. Um, we handle everything from licensing and compliance. We help with SOPs. Um, we keep them up to speed as the laws are changing so that they understand sort of where their business is going. You know, one of the things that was challenging last year was sort of hitting a moving target with packaging and labeling. So, um, you know, I'm sure you know <laughs> all about that. Um, so, um, you know, we try to keep up to speed with 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 the changes in the, in the laws. There's always, um, you know, a number of bills making their way through Sacramento. Um, we, we handle all sorts of contracts. So we handle distribution agreements and slotting agreements and um, even white labeling. And yes, there is a way to white label still. And, um, you know, branding opportunities and opportunities for, you know, joint ventures and strategic partnerships and all kinds of different things. So we, we try to help our clients and, uh, you know, we get creative, clients get creative to, to get the best results. Um, that really suits that particular, you know, deal and that particular need. Um, and then we are seeing more and more acquisitions um, and, you know, license acquisitions or, or really the company acquisitions or asset acquisitions. Um, and I expect to see a lot more of that. A lot of, a lot of folks really blitzed and, and, you know, got a bunch of licenses in every city where they could find them only to realize that you don't really need three manufacturing labs within 20 miles of each other. Um, so there's a lot of businesses that'll be kind of leaning down uh, and, and trimming the fat and, and cutting their their licenses loose. So so we'll see a lot more activity in that regard, and, and hopefully that again opens up new opportunities as well for folks that didn't get to participate the first time around. Yeah, I think we've seen um, you know a lot of consolidation in the industry, kind of starting with the vape crisis last year and just some cash flow issues. And now with coronavirus, you know, and every industry kind of being a little tough and we have some cash infusion, some interesting things going on in cannabis. But I, I agree that I think there's going to be some consolidation that was coming down the pipeline anyways um, from the initial, you know, as the, as the industry settles. So that's really interesting. And there's a lot of legal assistance that all of these companies are going to need to get all of those things done to change the corporate structure and continue growing. So um, I'm really grateful that you're a resource that people can reach out to. Um, where can they find you and your firm? Um, so my, my firm is the Cannabis Corporate Law Firm, and our website is uh, CannabisCorpLaw.com. Um, you can reach out to me directly, Dana, at CannabisCorpLaw.com, or call um, our phone number 714-676-2035. Uh, no one is there <laughs> right now, um, but someone will call you back. Um, we are checking the voicemails every day and returning calls. Um, we're just working remotely um, for the time being. Yep, keeping things going even now. Mm -hmm. Lots of work to be done. Well, thank you so much, Dana, for joining me today. This Thanks is for really having me. And I love learning about um, everything you're working on. So hopefully we'll have you on again soon. We'll keep, keep these conversations going. All right, thank you. Thank you so much.